Welcome, Justin. Hey. How are you doing? Pretty good. How are you? <laughs> yeah, not bad. Not bad. Hmm? All right. Start, start with what you do. I'm a photographer. I'm an art teacher. I started taking photos when I was probably 17. Um, finished university when I was 22. Tried to figure out a way to keep taking photos. Uh, worked as a cruise ship photographer. Then became a teacher so I could travel. And that's what I've been doing pretty much ever since. Uh, I came to Australia about nine months ago. And before that, I lived in Sweden for eight years. And prior to that, I was born in Canada. And uh, I guess a lot of my photos deal with travel, movement, trying to make sense of things, kind of exploring how we tell stories to other people or how we tell them to ourselves, try to make sense of, of where we are. So from Canada to Sweden <laughs> to Australia. Yeah. Okay, what... Well, how did you how did you decide that you wanted to travel like and, uh, and why sweden yeah okay what a sweden <laughs> so uh, i started traveling in university all of the photographers that i looked up to had done traveling and uh henri cartier bresson this french photographer that if you're into photography is essentially force fed to you at some point um all the magnum photographers right they kind of go around they see the world and then there's some joy to be had from the fact that they have this kind of vision, this consistency in it. And I told myself, okay, well, how do I make street photography worthwhile? How do I make some work that people might care about? Because I cared about that work. And usually when you start off, you start off by trying to imitate, right? Or recreating what you see. Uh, so at 22, I was given my mom's old van that they were gonna trash. I gutted it, put a, a bed in the back, a little water or like a you know two gallon jug of water and then i uh, lived in my van for three months did coast to coast i uh, saw most of canada um and then i got to halifax thought it'd be really good to kind of live there and work there was a door-to-door -door salesman and uh quickly found out that it's a hard life and a lot of the goals that i had in university right you're kind of told that if you work hard and if you kind of pay attention uh, you'll be rewarded and the work that I had for the first year and a half after I graduated was, was worse than any of the work that I've had when I was in high school or university. And I felt like really low. And I wanted to kind of get away, I guess, at one point. And um, my cousin told me that cruise ships have photographers. And I'd never been on a cruise ship, but I applied. And then I worked as a cruise ship photographer. And that's how I first got to Australia like 10 years ago and really liked it. The traveling, not the cruise ship photography. And um, it was eight months. We worked seven days a week. You didn't get a break. You worked 12 hour days. And I was like, again, this isn't the solution. I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. And I realized that if I became a teacher, I'd be able to travel. And that's how uh, I went back to school, became a teacher. And that's how I got to Sweden. Originally, I was going to teach English in South Korea. But um, there was an international school in Sweden that was doing interviews. And they said that I could actually teach a subject other than English. And I'd much rather teach art than English. And that's kind of what got me there. Um, what, what were you selling when you were doing door to door? <laughs> I was working for Eastlink. It's a, it's a company in Halifax. Uh, they do cable phone and internet. Um, I've got a good story if you want to hear kind of where I cracked in terms of finding out I didn't want to do this anymore. Yeah, yeah please do. Yeah. All right. Um, so there's two parts to this. Uh, I was I knocked on this door in like a, a rougher part of Halifax. It's across the bridge, and this person to open the door, and said, uh, you know, what do you want? And I said, I'm, I'm with Eastlink. We have cable, phone, internet. Like, how much are you paying for your internet right now? Your cable? And she was paying astronomical amounts. And I said, okay, well, like I I can do this for half easily. We can do it over the phone. It'll take 15 minutes. And she's like, oh, that's great. Like, come on in. So I walk in and right before I'm about to sit down, she goes, don't. And I, I sit down into the couch and I go, what's, what's, what's wrong? And she goes, our son loves maple syrup. I go, okay. And she goes, well, this morning he found one of the bottles and sprayed it over the couch. And so as I went to, to move, I realized I was kind of stuck to the couch. <laughs> and I only had one suit. And so I was washing my clothes the night before in a tub, letting it dry. And so I was already like, okay, it's okay. 
Uh, it's 100% commission. So if you sold the whole package, you'd get like 56 bucks, which in Canada at the time, that was like five hours at minimum wage. And I was like, okay, she wants everything. So it should be pretty good. So she goes, don't worry. Um, let me just get the credit card for my husband. I'll be right back. So I'm looking around and it takes me a little while to notice that there's a whole bunch of aquariums. And in those aquariums aren't fish. It's just a bunch of pot plants. And this is before it was legal in Canada. So I realized I was in a grow up. Oh, you mean not pot? Pot plants as in plants Not in pots. Not potted plants, but oh, like the right. five. Yeah. 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 And then she comes back and uh, has the card. So I, I've set up the phone call and um, I want to get out of there pretty quickly because it's illegal uh, at the time. And the person on the phone's like, actually, she owes like $450. Like we can't start an account. And I go, I'm, I'm really sorry. I can't do this with you today. Like, I, I don't know if you know this. It says that you owe like a bunch of money to the company. She goes, oh, that's because of my, my ex-roommate. Like, she stole my card. I'll, I'll settle this. So she goes away. She goes, I'll, I'll get my husband's card. Right? It'll be okay. And as I'm sitting there, they're outside. This is a little boy who comes up totally naked. And he goes, hey, what's your name? And I go, my name's Justin. And he goes, my name's Timmy. I swear, I swear to God. And he's like, he's, he's old enough that it's the, the nudity is kind of uncomfortable. He's like kind of, you know, if it's a really young kid, they're not self-aware. And, and he runs down the steps and you hear this. <laughs> and he stops and he kind of laughs and then he runs into the pool and then the, the mom comes back and she goes, I guess you met her son. And I go, yeah, he seems really nice. And she goes, don't worry, we're almost done here. And I'm calling, I'm still on the phone with this whole thing is happening, trying to keep a straight face. And uh, the girl goes, actually, he owes $600. And I'm like, okay, so I, I'm going to have to try to wash this gunk off of my clothes. I've seen some strange things. Like, this has been a waste of time. And I'm like, I'm really sorry. Like, I, she doesn't think it's going to go through today. We're going to have to do this some other time. And she goes, oh, does my husband owe some money too? I was like, yeah. Like, and she's like, okay, well, I'm really sorry. And then, and then her friend walks in. And she goes, hey, you know, Stacy or whatever her name was. Like, uh, this guy's been really nice. You just moved into your apartment. Do you need, do you need some cable, phone, or internet? I'm like... <laughs> please she goes yeah yeah come with me i'm like great okay so it's not a total waste of time and i follow her and uh, she goes we don't go through the front we go through the back okay we go around the building and there's two rottweilers in a huge cage and i go i go to pet them she goes oh you don't want to pet them they're not they're not pets and i go well, what do you mean and she goes well they're there to protect the drugs and I go, okay. So we go inside, it's kind of gutted. It's, there's nothing there and I do the phone call and it goes through, but it's only the phone. So I'll get like $15. And she goes, you better leave now. And I go, oh, I, I planned on leaving. Like, I, don't worry, don't worry. And she goes, no, no, no. Like my boyfriend doesn't like it when I'm alone with other guys. And if he sees you here, he's, he's gonna hurt you. And so I left and I walked the block and I sat down and I realized that for $20, two hours work in all of this strange occurrences, there had to be a, a, a better way. <laughs> so <laughs> that is my uh, terrible door-to-door -door experience. Well, it takes a rare breed to do a job like that. <laughs> and, uh, I'm, I'm glad I don't do it, I could be honest. <laughs> I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out why she invited you in if, if I don't uh, know her if boyfriend it... was going to have a problem with it. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. It's a... Uh... Yeah, that's a good story. Uh, let's uh, let's swing back to art. And um, so, obviously, you you quit after that, and that's when yeah. you went on to the cruise ships. Um, I so I quit because I rent. They never paid me, so they owed me money. They never paid me, and then because I've been traveling for a while, I I ran out of money and I went back home. So had they paid you, you might have kept going. It it would have been tempting. Like what happened is on a Friday night. I'd made a big sale and I was really excited and I went to the grocery store to get a frozen pizza on discount and my credit card and my debit card got uh, got denied. So I realized I had absolutely nothing left on the, uh, I called the guy, he said he could lend me money, but they'd already owed me money from the week before. And I realized like there was a really good, ch I mean, it was pretty much was a pyramid scheme, just you're selling through. Anyways, uh, so I, yeah, I, I left because I didn't really have a choice. I went back home. Didn't work on the cruise ship right away, worked at a call center, moved in with my grandma. It, she's great. She's very kind. She's still alive. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, and that's when I got, I was feeling really low and that's when I got the job on the cruise ship. Throughout this time, were you working on your art or yeah, like any I, projects? So I, 
Uh, I think there's like two types. I talk to my friend about this all the time. There's like two types of photographers. There's photographers that kind of always take pictures. Their daily life is their art. And then there's photographers that only take their camera out when they're working on something. I'm very much someone who's kind of always taking pictures and then I try to make sense of it after the fact. So I wouldn't say the photos were particularly good in that time, um, but I was shooting and you know tr I'm constantly trying to figure out a way to make sense of what's going on. They just, they were dark photos because I was in a dark place. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and so then, all right, you did the telly sales, uh, we'll probably gloss over that. And, yeah. uh, tell us about the cruise, cruise ship. Uh, so, I just started reminiscing about this because it's almost been 10 years. Um, so on the cruise ship, I worked for Image Corporation. Uh, if anybody wants to travel, it's a great way to travel. Like we didn't really leave North America. Well, we never left North America when I was growing up, let alone really travel outside of Canada. And it's expensive to travel and it's getting more expensive to travel. Um, so anyways, apply to Image Corp. They fly you over. I landed in Miami. I did three days of training there. A lot of it was repetition. Uh, I was the only one who'd been to university in photography. A lot of them were kind of more in sales or in kind of uh, theme park jobs previously. And there's a crash course. So you learn like 15 poses. You have to take five photos of couples or people alone. You have two and a half minutes in between each take. So you're supposed to go boom, tell them. So it's in terms of just brass tacks, it's really fun because you have to be able to guide people using your hands and using your words. There's not this stepping up to strangers and touching them and moving them. You have to do this really quickly. Um, we went to Australia, New Zealand, Alaska, Papua New Guinea, South America. Um, you know, it was, it was, I was really lucky. Some people do Jamaica for eight months and they do the same three stops over and over again. We cross the equator by boat. Um, and I got to see and meet a lot of interesting people. There's, you know, you're working with people from the, the Philippines, you're working with people from China, from North America, from, from all over the place. And uh, I learned a lot that way. This is another random story. On my very first day, it took like 26 hours to fly from, uh, at that point, we were in Orlando to this small island. Uh, right off the, the coast of Australia and uh, you get there and you start working as soon as you get there There's no like oh take a nap. You're you're a worker um, And I'm rushing to make it on time for my very first ship shift and uh, I almost knock into someone And I was walking on the right side of the steps and I'm like, I'm really sorry. I was rushing up uh, I'm sorry. I'm late like I knocked into this guy He was walking on the wrong side and right away. My boss was like, how do you know it was the wrong side? I go, well, like I was walking on the right side. They were walking on the right side coming down. They should be walking on the left. And they go, how do you know that where that person's from? They have to walk on the, the left side. And I, it, I know it sounds really goofy now. Maybe it was the, there's more internet there or something. But it had never even occurred to me that people would walk on the opposite side. I knew people drove on the opposite side, right, in Australia compared to Canada. But there really shook me. And that was kind of like the initial experience of like realizing my world had been very, very small. And kind of a lot of the photography from that has been awe in relation to there's so many things out there that we don't know or that we take for granted did i mean i imagine you're just taking you like things like portraits and on the on and, the on, ship on the ship yeah so so obviously you got a bit of inspiration and and uh, i guess you know a little bit to to think about just yeah. on that one experience of yeah. you know, people walking depending on where they come from <laughs> but did did shooting portraits like that, I'd imagine for some people, maybe yeah. you, it'd be a bit boring after a while and kind of draining. So it, it, it isn't, it isn't because everybody's different and you're meeting people with um, accents from all over the world, right? The default language is English, but like um, English was, I came more naturally to me than a lot of the people that I worked with because I grew up, uh, my mother taught me French, but I grew up speaking English relatively early and just seeing people excited and people with their families and going to all these different places. Like one of the things that was really fun, anytime we would dock, we'd have to go out and kind of follow people within a certain radius and take pictures of them. Another thing that you'll have to do if you decide to, to become a photographer on the ship, every second day you get to wear the costume. So one of the things that, I don't know if you've ever gone cruising. I had never gone cruising never. before. So um, you have to put on, like you'd, be, you'd become a dolphin or you become like a pirate and you're the mascot to try to drag these people. Your job is to hustle them into this photo. 
Um, and I, a few of us went to Disney University. So Disney, <laughs> there's a Disney, there's university. a Disney University. Okay. So we were, in, so we went to, we were in Miami there for three days and then four or five of us were driven to uh, Orlando. And while you're there, um, you stay at a hotel, you get kind of brought into Disneyland, you go underground. There's a whole subsection because Mickey Mouse uses a little bit of fairy dust to, tr to go from place to place, right? They don't want to see him just walking from place. So there's actually all of these amazing little corridors under Disneyland. And Disney University takes place under Disneyland. And you're told how to communicate with people, uh, to smile often, another easy thing. So in some cultures, it's disrespectful to point with one finger. So you're taught always point with two fingers or with a hand, right? Where do you need to go? This is the left, this is the right. If you point with one, it could be seen that way. So there's like, they kind of like drive this into you. You're there for two, three days. And that's the same thing. When you're in mascot, you're not supposed to talk. Everything is gestural. And it's the, the photographer who does the talking for you unless you have your face. So like as a pirate, you can put some makeup on and then you're... So when you're... you're so you're not dressed up in the costume like holding a camera. You're no, you're going, one or the you're other. You're going in, in yeah. the photos. For, for That's for Royal Caribbean. Uh, and Disney, they have their own. I eventually worked for Disney as well. Disney has their own like um, trained figures or mascots, whatever you want to call them. But all the royal stuff, yeah, the photographers have two roles. It's not it's not glamorous. <laughs> Do you get a lot of <laughs> like uh, just crazy drunk people? Like uh, you're gonna have to deal with. I, I, yeah. I've never been on a cruise, but it's, it's, I've heard the stories. No <laughs> We've all heard the stories. <laughs> They're wild, wild places. Yeah. Um, I mean dealing with that like is that something you enjoy or is it was it a bonus of the job so like we were lucky we're we're uh employees with faces so um the people that work in the laundry the people that do the dishes the cooking um are kind of always behind the scenes and they always have to stay underground it's very um time machine there's like levels or brackets so like the the lowliest workers are never visually that you can't be they can't be glimpsed by the travelers right because that would ruin the illusion that someone's sweating to get this clean bed for you that someone's sweating to cook this immense feast for you every single day we're allowed to be seen because we're like the fun people who are like let's make a moment let's make some magic right whatever kind of catchphrase you want to use um the drunk people can be really fun uh they're a lot of the times they're very rich and then a lot of the times they come with those ideas of what being really rich allows. So like a lot of them thought that we lived on another boat and that in the morning we would go from that boat onto the cruise ship to work. And then at night leave the cruise ship, even though there's no visible boat around them, that seemed totally logical. Um, but again, there's bad things, right? Like I, uh, so I was attacked by a drunken guest when we were in Alaska and I was gonna quit. Um, and that's when I started working for Disney. They just transferred me. And it's because there was a, um, finish the song lyrics competition. And I have a, a voice that can project. And I had 50 people on this huge staircase. And my job is to sell photos and place people in a way so that it's an attractive photo. So I had to shout over the competition to do this. And it was just bad timing. It hadn't really happened before. Um, and one of the guys that was there, the second time I ran up the stairs, grabbed my camera, pushed me over the banner and started choking me. It's very like Simpsons, like he turned the camera and was choked, like pushing, and I was calm. I knew there were cameras around, and I said, are you sure you want to do this? His wife was hitting him, like, stop it, stop. And then eventually he calmed down. Um, but cruise ships always want the visitors to be happy. So I was thrown in the cell. And I had in to the, explain. In the cell? There's a, there's a small prison in the boat. You got... You got thrown into prison. Yeah, they said, they, I was like, I, I found a witness. This old lady was like, what he did was not okay. I was like, great. She's blonde hair, mid fifties, red dress. The police came because I called them, right? We have like security on the boat. And they said, what happened here? And I was like, this guy just attacked me. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Come with us. And then I had to go down. And I was like, but I have a witness. They're like, don't worry about that. And then the captain came and he's like, I hear you're pressing charges. And I was like, yeah, I was attacked on the ship. And he's like, you know, we're in international waters. This is going to make things complicated for us. And I was like, well, you have cameras, right? They're like, actually, we don't have cameras at that specific spot. Do you have any witnesses? And I said, yeah, like there's this blonde haired, mid 50 year old woman in a red dress that was there. She volunteered, like I didn't ask her, she saw everything. 
And then the captain just kind of looked at me and said, do you realize how many people you've described on this ship? And uh, he said, you know, we can, um, we've, we'll can we call it in. Uh, we're docking in, I think it was Juneau or Ketchikan, someplace in Alaska. So it was, it'd be like an American case. And when the cop came on, he said, I hear you're, you're pressing charges. I said, yes. And he said, you know, um, unless you're 100% sure about this, he could also counter sue for defamation, right? That you're like attacking his character. And he said, like, what's, so what happened? And I explained it. And he's like, okay, you know, are you sure this is something you want to do? Um, we're backlogged. You'll have to come back up in like six, seven months time. And by that point, I'd already decided I wanted to go back to school to become a teacher. So I, it would interrupt my studies. I'd have to pay for the flight to sue. And it, I, yeah, I was like, you know what, it's not worth it. But here's the, the worst part. Um, if you think running into your family or friends in a small neighborhood is, is difficult, on a cruise ship, I had to continue working and I had to keep interacting with this guy. So he'd smirk and come and take a picture with his wife specifically at my booth and I had to pretend that nothing had happened. He never uh, apologized. No. Oh, I, don't, I don't think I'm ever going to go on one of these cruises. It sounds insane. <laughs> it sounds absolutely <laughs> insane. It's not, yeah. no, no place for a creative. No. Uh, I call it McTraveling, right? Because your food is given to you, your travels, they tell you where to go. They can like skirt you over. Another thing is all of the shops along the, the, the pier are owned by different cruise companies. And all of them have the same signs, right? We're closing today. 70% off. Because they know you're not coming back tomorrow. And so there's all this impulse buying. And one of the, one of the saddest things there was this old couple who'd been saving up for years. They really wanted to go to Alaska. And they were like, we're going to go on a hike today. We're really excited. And as he walked off the ship, there was like a, uh, a watch sale. And he spent his whole day at the, he spent like two and a half hours, three hours trying to pick out a Rolex or whatever it was. It was a, like a bougie uh, watch. And um, he came back for lunch and then they were tired and they didn't think they'd have enough time. So they never did the walk. And when I talked to them, they're like, yeah, we're really excited. But, you know, I got this great deal on this watch and it kind of took a lot of time. So we missed out. And I think that's one of the scary things about cruising and about like impulse buying. This pe these people saved up for know, several years thinking they were going to have the travel of a lifetime. And now he's got this watch that he got on impulse because it was a big sale that is going to be the exact same sale tomorrow. And he was totally manipulated to ruining this like this immediate experience to have this object that had you know, X amount of value to him at the time. Huh? It, it just strikes me as a kind of a a dark environment yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm sure you're glad you're out of it I mean that's why you went on to, yeah. to, to uni to, to teach to yeah. learn teaching I mean yeah. you know, it's like it'd be one, one thing would, that would, would be interesting I think is documenting it as a photographer and that so I'm, I'm, I've been recently doing that so uh, this happened almost 10 years ago now and going through all the old photos and trying to post, I kept a diary notes at the same time and trying to like, not relive it, but kind of revisit and see what's interesting. I think anybody who wants to document things, my biggest regret now looking back is the things that I took for granted, right? We lived in a bunk bed. It was a small room. You could you could sit on the toilet, brush your teeth and sh or like wash your hands and shower your head in the same space. Like that's how small the washroom was that was shared. And I don't think I ever bothered taking a picture of it. Like the living environment was interesting. There's something called the I, the I-95. So there's this huge hallway underneath the ship that all of the workers used to get from one point to another efficiently, like the fastest way. And I think I only took one or two photos. I was obsessed with trying to document people and the cities I was visiting. But I don't know how, you know, how many people get to live in the bowels of a cruise ship and how many times do you document this thing? And so that's, one of those, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of a different space to, to live. There's not that much light, right? You're kind of like a little vampire. Most I, of the I'd, time. I'd like to see your prison cell. <laughs> <laughs> so, so on to teaching. Uh, you studied in Canada, or yeah, yeah, Canada, yeah, the University of Ottawa. Okay, and so what? What? I mean, it just sounds. It seems like a jump, you know, from. Yeah sales and tele sales yeah. and working on ships to teaching like is it something is it something that you thought about for a while was it a, a decision on a whim mm -hmm. and i guess why did why why did you right. choose that that okay. path um i started taking pictures when uh, my dad was diagnosed with cancer 
and I was 17 or 18 at the time and we're doing presentations at the same time um, and there was all of these ideas in terms of like hoping not to forget something, trying to present yourself as something. Um, anyways, I went to this uh, one week kind of photo op uh, at a university. If you had good grades, you could do this. And I came back and there was a Relay for Life, like a cancer walk for, for my dad. And I took a bunch of pictures and people liked it. And when I got to university, I kept taking pictures as a way to like de-stress. I, my parents told me, um, there's like a lot of people here, like there's no point going in the arts, you won't be able to live off of it. Right? You won't be able to make any money. So I, I studied um, in my first year, I majored in English, but kept doing, taking pictures, kept getting good feedback and then did a double major. And one of the reasons I got into teaching was it seemed like a good idea to be able to get a full-time job, know how much income was coming in. And if I became an English teacher, um, I could travel and work, right? There, it's a little different now because you can work from home or you can kind of like set yourself up if you're in IT and work kind of anywhere in the world. But 10 years ago, it felt like it'd be really hard to pack up and go. And there's not that many jobs that you could work anywhere in the world because there's a language barrier, right? If you want to work in Brazil and you don't speak Portuguese, it's going to be difficult. If you want to work in Germany and you don't speak German, it's going to be difficult. And so teaching English would be an easy way because I don't have the money or didn't have the money to just travel for extended periods of time. And teachers get a summer break and teacher gets term breaks. So when it comes to visiting a new city, you're guaranteed if you save your pennies, every year you can probably see something new or go somewhere new. Yeah. And that was it. And I mean, I also, I like talking about art. I like sharing information on art. I like uh, photographers, painters, films, literature, like it's all intertwined and everything influences one another. And I, that's one of the reasons I got teaching is it's also, if you're working in the arts, it's really hard to have a full-time job connected with it. A lot of it, you're either independent and you're kind of a contractor and you kind of, you're a wedding photographer, you are a food photographer, you work for a newspaper, or uh, you do another job and this is what you do in your spare time. Uh, an art teacher, you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get an, an, a paycheck coming in every few weeks and you also get to do something you, you love. Uh, did you teach in Canada? I taught in Canada very shortly for my practicum. Um, so to become a teacher, you have to teach at two different schools. It might have changed now in Canada. And uh, so I taught art at two different schools. And then prior to that, I'd also been teaching adults living with mental um, health disorders and used art as a way to like de-stress and express themselves. So it, it wasn't totally new. Um, I worked at a print shop and taught people how to print stuff while I was in university. Like it, it's things that I, I kind of had been doing in the past. Um, I also think if you like to talk, teaching, it's a weird space because people kind of have to listen to you. <laughs> if, you're, if you're a teacher and you sit in front and you start talking about these things, you have hopefully an engaged audience. And if you like to talk, right? And what's brutal is is essentially monologues a lot of the time. Right? You can ask for feedback, but if you have shy students to begin with, you get to say what you know, and then you get to say more of what you know, and then engage in a conversation or get them to work. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's working here as well, <laughs> to be honest. You keep, keep going, keep telling the stories. So you went from Canada to Sweden then, yeah. and you were, you were teaching in Sweden. Yeah. Um, how, how did that differ? Like, I'm curious how, like, they're two... Like how the kids are they, were? Are they very different countries? I don't even. I've never been to either. Um, Sweden is a very cold, like emotionally and physical space. Um, people who, uh, this is a generalization. Right? Not everybody's like this. Not all, all Swedes are like this. But from my experience there, um, when Swedes are growing up, they have a few key friends that they make in elementary school. And they stick with those key friends the rest of their life. In Canada, I'd say, and maybe in Australia, usually you have two, three friends from elementary school, two, three friends from high school. And then if you go to university, two, three, or college, two, three friends from university, college, or if you go into work, then you have some of those friends. And you have kind of these like tiers to your friendships. In Sweden, almost everybody I met had known everyone for 
15, 20 years. I started when I got there, I was in my early 20s. When I left, I was in my early 30s. And so it's, it's strange working there, knowing that the people you're encountering, if you want to be their friend or you want to be part of their social space, the next step down, they've known for 10, 15 years. And so as a teacher, you can also kind of see that at play with the students. The students who make these friendships, it's, it's very, um, they're very intense friendships and they're very close, small groups, right? Um, if it's, it's not normal to want to start a conversation in a bus. It's not normal to talk to a stranger in a cafe, in a restaurant, in a bar. And so um, this applies for adults, but also you asked about school. The, the children there um, kind of form these little, not alliances, but these really deep friendships that will take them through the rest of their life. And so when it comes to teaching groups like that, it's very much pockets of people um, for, forcing or trying to engage large scale interactions among them isn't something that's necessarily uh, normal. And they're comfortable doing it. It's not that they're awkward interacting with groups of people, but it is a different space when it comes to just um, this idea of a team. And as I get older, it's also something that I think a lot about when it comes to art. One of the things that I caught myself repeating often is the fact that when you're young, all of your, your friends who want to make art, all of your friends who are making art, um, could eventually become your, your allies, right? And it's, there's a default when you're a kid to think you need to be solitary, you need to be unique, you're gonna make this thing by yourself. But as you get older, I, I'm sure you've gone through a similar experience, you realize like, if you don't have a social space to interact with, um, why would someone want to look at your work? Right? Your friends might be interested in it. Your, your friends are interested in the people you know are interested in it. But this idea of like um, trying to be isolated and, and uh, create something on your own is something that is a story a lot of people tell, but it's not in practice, it's very difficult. And so one of the things that's really interesting about Swedish students who become artists is the art is really dark. And the art is often about these solitary figures this this person who feels kind of isolated we we didn't have a big covid thing uh so i know melbourne had like the most intense lockdown in the world whereas sweden might have been the least like i didn't really miss a day of work during covid students didn't wear masks teachers didn't wear masks we went to school every day and and did our job throughout the entirety of, of the outbreak um and i don't know how the work the artwork will change now, but when you get there, a lot of the photography that I was looking at, um, Christer Stromhelm, Anders Petersen, um, was it something Josephson, those that lived through into their 80s, their 70s, uh, always shot in black and white. It was grainy, it was loose, um, and it was very emotional, it was very psychological. It had to do with this sense of displacement or exile. And that's, it's interesting because it's coming from a space where Sweden's very much a first world country, right? It, it's seen as kind of a utopia by the rest of the world. But the art that's being made there is not pastel and bright and happy. It's Why do you think that is? Uh, well, where I lived during the winter time, there was only like three, four hours of sunlight. And so you're in an actual dark space. Um, it's very common to have lots of candles or just like um, deflected light. So it's super rare to have just a light over your kitchen. You'll have like a little lampshade or a lamp on the side that'll put the light in. And so you're, you're kind of living in a relatively dark space. You're in, in both interior and exterior, both physically and emotionally, you're kind of distanced. Um, and that plays out. And I mean, it, it makes for really emotionally dense art. But you have to realize that the person that's making this is having to cope with this and go through this, which is very different than, you know, if you're surrounded by people, you're in a cooperative and you're making work and you're kind of talking to one another. I think a lot of the, the, the work in Sweden was an expression of the self. And I think that also influenced my, my pictures when I moved there. Is it possible that there's kind of like a, a cultural, um, something lost in translation there where, you know, you might see it as a bit depressing? Yeah. But the people who have created this, uh, um, I guess, dark work, yeah. don't see it as dark. Oh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. I think, I mean, it's also 
very rarely would anyone feel like expressing themselves is something that's depressing. Even if it's a dark work, the fact that you're able to channel that energy into something is always something that you can celebrate. And I think um, Sweden helps its artists quite a bit. So it, it's, it, I, I didn't apply for grants, but I had dated someone who did. And a lot of the time, if you just show that you're trying to make work, uh, you can get some funding. And so there's a lot of support for artists. And I think it's changing, right? There's different political parties, all of this stuff. But it, there's a very, um, side note, one of the most amazing things about Sweden, and it happened while I was there, um, all publicly owned museums are free. And if you think about free social spaces now, with the exception of libraries, how many places in Melbourne, in Australia, and Canada can you go into that have a roof over their head and have air conditioning or heating on, right? Where you don't have to pay something to enter, you don't have to buy something to show that you're there, right? And this is like a cultural institution. You have, you have paintings, you have video, and all of these museums were free. And so in terms of the students having access to these things, that's also pretty special because they can see and you can have a conversation about dark work that they can just choose to go and see without their parents if they want to. They can, if they're hanging out with their friends, they can enter into these spaces without worrying about money. They can hang out there for extended periods of time without having to buy something and engage with work that maybe not everybody wants them to see. So that's also something that made the students in Sweden interesting. It's a very open space for them to interact with art. And, and you're, you're teaching here now. Mm -hmm. And I mean, how would you compare um, the arts mm. industry or and arts education here compared to Sweden? It sounds like you're, you're pretty impressed. <laughs> Boy, so and actually you, you're selling it to me really well i, I yeah. want to live in sweden where it's <laughs> where it's dark and lonely that's my kind of place and there's a lot of nature there so i think the people you also you, you become one with nature because there's forests everywhere and um, there's something called i'm, I'm going to mispronounce it so i feel bad all men's landing which is like every man's land and so people can go and camp anywhere they want in sweden without having to pay anything as long as they pick up after themselves which is pretty amazing yeah, I think I'm going to start booking <laughs> tickets now. Actually, <laughs> uh, uh, when it comes to when it comes to art education, I think one of the biggest differences is how loose the Swedish um, structure is. So it's very much left up to the teacher to interpret what they're teaching. So you know, a general guideline will be something like um, students have to express themselves in a personal way. Well, you can use any type of material you want to do that, right? You can do acrylic, you can do watercolor. There's no fixed agenda that you have to use such and such materials. And that personal expression is also open to the teacher. In Australia, it's also somewhat loose, but it is a little bit tighter when it comes to the government does have a bit more of a say or does try to have a bit more influence on what's being taught in the classroom and, and how it's being taught. Um, yeah. Example. Uh, put me on the spot. Um, so I taught at a, at a middle school in Sweden and I teach at a middle school here. And what is a middle school? That's high school. That's like, like grade seven, eight, nine, ten. 10 is okay. like, so it's, it's like not quite the eldest bracket. So there's gymnasium in Sweden, which would be the equivalent of like when you're 17, 18, 19. So I was teaching at the school before they moved on to that. So the cap here would be like grade 10. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Now I'm Because I, yeah. I know primary school, high school, yeah. uni. Yeah. That's, so this yeah. is like little transition gap where things change. Um, I would say here, it's difficult to talk about because I've, I've worked at a school that was somewhat different in its practice. Um, in terms of rubrics in Sweden, the students uh, are very, very in need of precise guidance. So you, as a teacher, you can choose whatever you want, but when you grade someone, you have a very fixed kind of block set where you're going, this is what you need to do to get an A, this is what you need to do to get a B, a C, etc. cetera. Um, in Australia, one of the things that's kind of different, at least where I was working, rubrics aren't always kind of enforced. And also the grading system is kind of like on a, it's almost like a, a gauge on a camera. So. There's an expectation that you should be able to do X amount of work in grade seven. And then towards the end of the term, it might be seven and a half. And so your your translation of an A, a B, and a C is something that's kind of on a, in, in flux. 
that's why it again i was told it that way by one person and then told something different by someone else so there seems to be a little bit more room for interpretation in the australian curriculum than there was in sweden when it comes to just assessment and the students that i was teaching um very rarely asked for um, extra reasons as to their grade whereas in sweden i provide kind of a step-by-step this is what you did this is what you can improve and then in sweden you're also allowed to resubmit your work until the end of the year so when you give feedback that student has the choice and the, the freedom or their liberty to resubmit several times is this resubmit these like the same work the same yeah. concept so yeah. they can so if they painted something <laughs> and it, it it was you know the the outlines are kind of um rough and the the gradients need extra work and there's no real highlights or it's kind of flat there's no shadows um you can write that down and go you know on the left arm you got to emphasize this and then they can try to improve it and then you can give them feedback you're not quite there yet and then they can resubmit again and so you can have a, a student go from like a d to a b or an a right there's questions about that too what's fair if is, is, is there a risk of like students becoming like especially if they become a professional or, or semi-professional artist that kind of trains them into being a little too obsessive about their work? Oh, I think we have conversations about that uh, when I was there. And I always go, uh, it's something I wish I would have heard when I was growing up. Your grade has nothing to do with your skill or your talent as an artist. Your grade in an art class has everything to do with government expectations, right? So I've been told... I have to assess you within this parameter. I've interpreted this parameter and given you a rubric. So the government says you need to be able to do this thing, right? If you do this thing very well, you get an A. If you do this thing less well, you get an E or an F or a D, whatever, depending on what you're teaching. Um, but again, that has absolutely nothing to do on whether or not the work is good. All it has to do is it has an, in, it's in relation to whether or not the work meets those requirements. And when you think about painters, if you like minimalism, right, there's a reason why we don't really teach or make minimalist projects in school. Because how do you explain to a 14 year old the fact that this Rothko inspired painting is an A and the other one is a D, right? To be able to show like this is slightly different. So this is, this is a better work of art, but it's two rectangles on top of one another. And that I think is really important. And I think it's really important uh, for, for students that they never get discouraged, that they never stop making art as a result of whatever grade they got. Because I'm sure lots of photographers flunk out, lots of painters flunk out, and it's because they see the world differently. Right? And that's, that doesn't fit within that grading bracket, but it does fit in the art world, right? in something unique and original. Because so I think it's sort of like, even like you know, you're saying you could go, a student could go back to their work, uh, improve it yeah. based on what the, the teacher has said. Yeah. I mean, I think there's something to be said about the fact, just accept that what you made was right. um, was maybe subpar yeah. by your own standards and just move on to, to the yeah. next piece and just that's part of the journey instead of just, uh, you know, rehashing or right. trying to perfect this one, yeah. one concept. Um, also, I, I'd imagine it, it could lead to like arts education like this, yeah. just like this homogenized style of art with everybody's making the same yeah. thing because you have to shade this way or you mm -hmm. have to, I don't know, I'm not, I don't think I put my hand in front of <laughs> sorry. Um, you know, you have to, even I, I'm guessing holding a brush, Yeah. if you hold it differently, it'll interact with the canvas differently. 100%. And I think... You shouldn't tell someone how to hold a brush. There's parameters, yeah. right? And I think a lot of it comes down again. The difficulty with that is where do you draw the line in terms of your influence as a teacher? I was working with, uh, there's like these at IES, International Gelska School, and, and there'd be these kind of like uh, meetings where schools out of the area would get together and talk. And there was a woodwork teacher once who said, I don't know why I have to come up with my own projects. I just want someone to tell me what I have to tell the kids and then I'll just repeat it to them. Um, and that's where some of that can become dangerous. That's where people are making the exact same thing. I think what I tried to do is create kind of a loose parameter. So if we're making a propaganda poster, I, what I used to always say was, you can do anything you want, 
um, as long as it's something that you deeply care about. So the easiest way to do this, is there anything that a lot of people believe in that you wish they didn't? Or is there something that nobody believes in that you wish they did? And we had people talk about absolutely everything. Some po some kid made a poster that they, uh, for flat worlders or flat earthers. So the whole poster was like, uh, and it was connected to a meme saying like, oh, it's flat and it, it's always has been. Another person uh, was talking about global warming and it was a polar bear on top of a car with in Uppsala, there's a very famous cathedral. So you saw the cathedral kind of submerged in water and this polar bear floating through. We had people talk about equality and pay we had people talk about like uh, dress code in schools, like it was all over the place and you know, it did look different. And that's also knowing when to let the kid or the student express themselves in a unique way. And the students who might be struggling, that's where it's not conforming, but there's like a set of guidelines that can elevate something from the big difference, I guess, being um, if it looks purposeful or not, does it have an intent? And that's where I think the difference between like a, a low quality work and a higher quality work is are these lines are these movements are these gradients intentional and that's still you can have any style you want if it's with intent so how, how, how do you determine that if something's <laughs> how can you look at someone's work and determine that something they did was intentional okay um when it comes to painting there could be some consistencies that you see. So it could also be in terms of the types of color that they're using. Um, if they're just mixing everything by hand, there should be some inconsistencies because they're making their own colors. If it's just straight out of the packet, it'll look relatively flat. There's nothing wrong with that, but if it's just like key colors that are there, right, it won't look nearly as realistic. That, again, that doesn't mean to say that it's not on purpose, um, but you can ask them. And if you have a doubt that something uh, was intentional or not, you can also ask them to, to redo it. It's not something that ever I really felt ever really came up. Um, but it's something that I guess is worth acknowledging. And it's also, again, it's not necessarily the, the truly great artists that are getting A's because sometimes it's the kids who want an A that'll just keep refining the work until they get the grade they want. Whereas the artist, the more artistically minded person might be like, well, this is me, I'm good. And that's okay as well. Actually, how early how early on can you spot some, uh, that someone has potential to become a professional artist? I'm curious about that. How do you how do you tell? So, I would say out of the students that I've had, the ones that often again it's a generalization. Uh, but the ones that often have the most potentials are the ones that are most hard headed. So they go like you're teaching them a way to do something and they go, but I like doing it this way. And you go, that's fine. Okay, and then what are you trying to do with this? And then you guide them. And that, that's when you notice that students have already developed a personal style or an aesthetic, right? It could be something that they found on YouTube that they really like and they're working on. It could be something that they've developed independently. It could be that they watched a, a movie or a show or they've seen a bunch of paintings or they have parents that paint and they, they're emulating what they've seen. But there's definitely a passion involved when you have a 14 year old and you're going, well, we've shown you how you should be painting this way or drawing this way or using charcoal this way. And they go, I know, but I want to do it this way. That's kind of a hint. It's not encouraging people to be hard headed, but it is showing you that already there's this creative impulse going, I understand you've taught me how to do something. And it's not that I disagree that that can be done that way, but I know that for what I want to express, I have to do it in this way. There's, choices again intent choices and intent are being made and again you can look at that work side by side after the fact and notice similarities or patterns you know people have we all have obsessions and the the, the artists whatever that might mean um or younger will often have themes running through their work that weren't put in place by me it'll be something that keeps popping up because it's something that they're they love or they're obsessed with or they're passionate about and I guess is is the opposite as well. Is there have you had um, I guess instances where you've had student a student that has all the marks of potential to be mm. a great artist in Sweden or Australia, yeah. or whatever, and it and it just hasn't happened for them. It's like, can you spot that as well? And I'm not saying I, you would never say I mean, it, say I mean, that I, to a I, child. You can't. You of course, can't like, 
You can't predict what happens in someone's life. I would say on average that a lot of the, the students that I teach are way more talented than I was at their age. Um, but you have to have a desire to keep doing it. One of the things that I talk to all of my graduating students who are interested in continuing making art is I remind them that they might have been really good at doing what I told them to do or at going against what I told them to do. But what they need to understand is once they graduate, there's no one that's going to be there telling them they should be doing anything at all. And so it's easy to fight against someone when you're an artist, and it's easy to do a project uh, when someone's giving you a, a subject or a theme to run through. It's incredibly difficult when you graduate university and you've had people telling you what to do and giving you feedback on how to do things your entire, your entire career to then go, now I'm alone. Now I have to choose what I'm doing. And we all go through that process, right? Uh, Neil Gaiman says this, like, we start off by emulating, we copy, we steal, because most of us at a relatively early age can find work that we enjoy. And then when we don't know what to do, we try to make work similar to that. And there's this barrier, right? You, you do need to understand how things are done to be able to emulate them. But then what separates emulators or copiers is the people who can understand that and then find they have something personal to say. And it's kind of trailing off from that. And those, those same students who were either doing their own thing and doing great work or very, very able, uh, well, able to fulfill the expectations of the project and really doing incredible work. They're both going to hit this wall later on where, you know, it's 11 o'clock at night, you're alone on a, on a Sunday night, Saturday night, whatever, and you want to make something. Uh, with the internet now, there are so many influences and it's so easy to find artists and photographers. Where do you start? What do you have to say? What makes you unique? Because so much has been done before and so much great work exists in the past that kind of we're always engaging in a dialogue. We're always engaging with a conversation with the work that came before us. And even if you don't know that you're kind of stealing ideas or working from something beforehand, there might be someone who sees your work and goes, this is derivative, this looks like that. And the truly great art is when it's something unique. And it might look like something else, but you can look at an artist's work and go, this is definitely so-and-so's because of X, Y, Z, right? There's this passion that, that kind of shows up. Yeah, and it's very tough now because there's so much there's so much art. There's, I, I think you know, the approach I take for myself is I just kind of take the photos that I want to take. Yeah. And uh, if it if it turns out that it looks like somebody else's, I just uh, I kind of I don't show anyone. <laughs> Basically, I just you get go, to self edit. I, I think maybe I maybe I saw it and I got you mm. know subconsciously pinched pinched the idea. I think that happens, and that's okay, you know. Yeah. Um, the reason I'm curious about like students and and things like that is especially when you know you go from high school, and uh, someone decides to go to art school. Yeah. A career as an artist is just ninety nine percent of artists don't make yeah. don't make a living and will never make a living from it. So it's a really risky, risky undertaking, mm. and I mean, and you'll have you'll have more, uh, I guess, high schoolers wanting to go to art school mm -hmm. than. Oh, how am I going to phrase this? If if ten yeah, if ten of your art students want to go to art school, yeah. well, there's a good chance ten of them won't have a career. I well, I think I. When you, when you look at the artists who have made it, there are some exceptions, right? Like T.S. Eliot worked at a bank and he wrote poems in his spare time and he was able to make it. And then there's romanticized versions like Jack Kerouac who goes all in, lives his life and writes about his life and then becomes famous as a writer and can, can stop doing like manual labor or whatever. The difficulty now is like living is expensive. And these, these artists back in the day, if they chose to become part of whatever counterculture existed. Um, they could find cheap living arrangements, right? You, you, yeah, that maybe there were rats in your apartment and cockroaches, but you could find a cheap place to live in 
and you were dry and you had a roof over your head and you could make that work. And, and again, these stories of like landlords accepting a painting by an up and coming artist. Can you imagine a landlord in Melbourne who's never seen your work and you've never exhibited somewhere accepting, um, you know, a meter long canvas as payment for the two thousand or twenty five hundred dollars that, that you owe in rent? I have a hard time imagining that people would be OK with that now. I might do it. But, <laughs> um, that's just me. Yeah. So so you have it, it's becoming harder and harder because there's a place for these rundown apartments. Rundown apartments mean cheaper rents, and they might not be safe in the way that we want them to be, but they also allow people to work less often, which allows them to do more art. When everything is clean, you're kind of forced to live with your parents or to have to work to afford your rent. And I think what's becoming difficult is people who want to become artists in the old way of thinking, this romanticized way of thinking where they can self-support themselves have to kind of abandon everything else. That's the difference, you, you always hear this, that, that again, we don't know because it's the stories of what's being told to us, but there's this romantic idea that these people weren't working, were living off of like, you know, they, they walked out to the bakery and they could get the leftover bread at the end of the night and they were able to support themselves that way and keep making their work. But truly great art does generally come out of hard work, perseverance, you know, dedication and, and luck, right? Like. You know, a lot of people kind of stumble across their their style by accident. They're exploring something and then it works and then it's something great. But you need the time to do that. Yeah, and yeah, cost of living. Um, and I'll be honest, people are a lot more, as, as a whole, society is more greedy, more impatient these days than, than maybe... 40 years ago or something mm. like that um people don't want to accept accept the struggle Changes. yeah you know um and look i, I myself I'm, I'm one of those like i i, I barely get by to do mm. all this to run run the gallery to do my own work i still i still have to work i still have to work right. a job right and you know it gets hard it gets tiresome after a while so i mm. get it why why people don't want to do that um but yeah and of course you and we're all bombarded with stories especially on like social media things yeah. like that of people it just happening like that for people and look how you know amazing amazing my life mm. is and oh, i just did this painting and i sold it for ten thousand dollars and there's also the cult yeah. of youth to it right like it's always more interesting to hear this 18 year old photographer painter sculpture uh, has created this thing and now it's getting big then then finding out the guy in his mid 50s who's been slowly kind of churning out work for four, 30 years finally gets his big break it doesn't make the news quite as much mm. right unless he's dead and then it's been found in the attic or there's like vivian meyer with her photographs right this nanny who's just this great photographer on the side that no one knew about but we don't know what it would have been like had she been alive when the work was found i think it also lets other people manipulate the work we don't know what she wanted people to see. It does, but I think it, it for her in mm. in Vivian Mayer's case, mm. it probably worked out perfectly because she took the photos she wanted right. to take. She enjoyed her life, right? Right. She doesn't know now what's going on. She mm. doesn't know how famous she is. Mm. It's fine. There's right? a, I guess, I guess you could say that. There's also a Jean or Jean Reese wrote um, wide Sargosa Sea. And one of my, my favorite books called Good Morning Midnight. And so when she was younger, she wrote four or five novels that were critically well received, but sold nothing and then didn't write anything for years and then published a book that became extremely famous. And when they asked her about it, she said, it's great, but it came too late. I had published in there, I think it was like her late sixties, early seventies. And she said, like, I spent my whole life thinking I was an artist trying to make good work and couldn't make the work that I wanted to do because I couldn't afford to. And I, I knew my work was good, but nobody noticed until now. And what does noticing now give me in terms of my life? So I, I think it is kind of this, again, I don't think she was particularly trying to get famous or trying to be well known, but there's a big difference between being able to live off of your art while you're young and you can enjoy it, right? You talk about having to do like side jobs or having to hold a full-time job and also try to make art. Imagine how, how much more work would be made and possibly better, more creative work if, if the people who wanted to make their work had the hours to do it in the week. 
Well, yeah, but oh, s- some artists, mm-hmm. you know, at the same time, mm-hmm. you know, their struggle. I think you mentioned Bukowski earlier. Yeah. I mean, uh, the right, post the office, of <laughs> you know. Well, you know, and that's why it's romanticised because, right. you know, the struggle and all yeah. that sort of stuff. It just, as an art teacher, mm-hmm. like, do you broach this subject at all with students? Oh, man. Um, I guess it depends because it's difficult that the the artists who lead, who lead hectic lives don't always lead lives that you can talk about with students. Some of the some of the painters, photographers, days, anyway. writers, yeah, have done some pretty um, wild things, and figuring out if it's okay to talk about that, you know, these parents. If you tell them what these artists did and they're like, I really want to be like this person. And then you get a phone call from a parent being like, did you tell my kid that this person did this? That makes for a strange conversation. Um, What it does lead into, and it is really interesting now, this growing conversation over whether or not we should celebrate the work of people who have done kind of terrible things. Um, You know, Woody Allen comes to mind. Anyways, there's a lot of different you know, Roman Polanski. And so you can say from, from, from a certain vantage point, you know, Rosemary's Baby or Chinatown is this amazingly crafted work of art. From another vantage point, it's the work of art of a pretty, you know, a man who made questionable decisions and has done some pretty terrible things. And admitted, like, joyously in interviews, you can see him kind of joyously going, I did that, but it wasn't her first time. And trying to rationalize it to the whole world and people have kind of glossed it over. So it, it's, you know. I mean, I mean, should we be separating the art from the artist? <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm the right person to be able to make <laughs> that judgment call. I, I think, I think that um, it's difficult because if you don't know what the artist did ahead of time and you see the work, right, you can feel conflicted. You can watch something and think it's an amazing painting or an amazing movie, and then be told after the fact that that person did X, Y, Z, and then feel like oh, I don't really like that person. But the fact was when you first saw the work without context, it brought you joy. And there's something to be said about that. Again, it's not to justify anyone's behaviors, but there's been a long history of people doing some pretty weird things and, and we we still celebrate them. Yeah, and look, and what we were talking about earlier about struggling artists and things like that, is, is it's hard. You can't separate no. the art from the artist. Um, I just thought I'd throw that in there to uh, kind of challenge mm. you a little bit. Yeah. But, um, I mean, so that that would dictate that the artists you can talk about then in I, to your students. I guess it, it just it, it definitely brings up um, what you feel comfortable as a teacher talking about too, because bringing up those conversations, you're gonna you have to be prepared to discuss them and discuss them fairly, right? Like um, I'm trying to think of another. Another artist that could have had his life changed at the time because of the laws at the time. Um, there was uh, Goya, um, was almost put to death by the church because he depicted violence um, in a very honest way, right? The, the French had kind of backstabbed the Spanish and he was showing all of these people getting murdered and slaughtered and they're going like, you can't do this, like this is... This is too violent. And he goes, but the kids and the parents are seeing this in the streets. How is this painting too violent? Like these, this is actually happening outside our door. And I guess also, I mean, people are going to find out by themselves. And that's part of the fun in a way of like finding your own, uh, discovering artworks and artists uh, by yourself. Yeah. You know, you don't, it doesn't need to be handed hundred percent handed to them by a teacher um have to kind of uh... there's a sense of self-discovery that makes it almost more worthwhile i had a conversation with a friend about that for books like if someone gives you a book and says this is worth reading or you're in a used bookstore in a library and you stumble across something and you read it not knowing what's what's going to happen to you going in it can totally change your your life like everyone's read a book that surprised them and inspired them and changed their way of thinking about things yeah i don't think you can um it's very uh, uh, hit and miss recommending a book to mm. someone and telling mm. them it's good because they might not like it. 
And yeah. I'll never trust you again. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's better to discover on your own. Mm. And, um, you know, it, it helps having somebody uh, with more experience and more knowledge to kind of guide guide someone down a path. They're like but signposts. They need to discover it themselves. Yeah. Um, after that, I think that's that's probably the uh, the best way. Um, look, I think we can wrap it up there. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy with this. Are, are you? Yeah, it's sure, like you're man. freaking out, man. <laughs> <laughs> you said slippery slope. We're not, I, we're not sliding anymore. I promise. But uh, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot more we could have talked about. You, yeah. You've uh, led so far an interesting life, and um, and unfortunately, we didn't really get to talk much about your work. <laughs> Yeah. Unless you want to, you know, whatever you feel, give, give give someone give, give everyone a, you know, ten minutes on, on your. I mean, I could ask you a question. Whatever you want. Okay, we won't wrap it up now. Then. <laughs> okay. Um, well, go into your work a little bit. What like what are you, what are you photographing? Um, I mean, it's it's, it's changed since I started taking pictures, but I guess, um most of my work has to do with daily life and I got wouldn't say obsessed but kind of um, <clears throat> intrigued by the idea that our daily life is filled with images right we, we, we see more images on a daily basis now than um, in someone's entire lifetime like a hundred years ago just in terms of on our phone on our images like going to the movies being able to watch TV shows anytime you want like we're kind of bombarded with this and we're kind of an image culture. And thinking about that, thinking about the pictures that we take, I became kind of uh, very preoccupied with the stories we tell ourselves, right? We take, we take. there was a quote that I really like. I don't remember who said it, it was a photographer. And he said, um, show me what you take pictures of and I'll tell you what you're afraid of losing. And I think that's a really. Who said that? I, I can't remember who it was, but it was it, it was show, yeah. And I kind of made me really think about so when I started taking pictures, I was taking pictures of friends, I was taking portraits of strangers, and it was very much about connection. And then as I moved away, and I don't know if you'd call it exile or or um, lived in different spaces and had to meet new people, a lot of the work was trying to make sense of how. I got to where I was. So my, I would say I usually, the pro, the finished projects um, are sequenced images. So I look through uh, at the pictures that I took for a week, a month, it could be on a trip, it could be when something like um, dramatic happened in my life, if, if it was a move, a breakup. And then I look at the pictures that I took at that sort of time and then try to tell a story with them. Now the story happens to be for me, but it's also for anybody who's interested in seeing. And if you put one image after another, uh, especially in a photo book, which is how I think of my projects most of the time um, one image following another tells a story because if there's a shape that's repeated if there's a subject that's repeated a color an angle suddenly there's a comparison being made and you can choose to push that in a direction as a viewer um, or not it can just be seen as two separate images but as a creator usually you're assuming that if that person looked at this page the next one's following um, there's some sort of meaning if you can that you'd like to give them Right. If you like uh, show a sign that says no walking and then you see someone uh, walking and then you see footsteps on someone's back, that will create some sort of narrative. That doesn't mean that you took each photo one after the other, but as opposed to just having them jumbled together, placing them together in a certain order tells a story. And I think most of my projects have to do with me looking back on these periods of time and trying to make sense of why a specific thing happened or did, was I feeling a certain way and so my pictures changed? Was I taking pictures and that actually influenced how I was feeling at that time? Um, I guess they're very personal, but I think everyone's photographs are personal. And at the same time, by kind of acknowledging this, I'm hoping other people will also maybe look at their images and see, okay, like, why was I taking pictures of this thing? Or like, I didn't actively want to take pictures of this subject, but they keep repeating. So I, I really like reflections. I like glass. I like handprints and patterns. I, I like um, really ancient kind of cave art, this idea that these people who might not even have been able to 
speak using words the way we think of today, we're able to put a handprint on a wall and kind of communicate, I was here. And the idea that you still see people smudging or putting handprints on a wall. That fascinates me. Marks, right? If you go to a wall and you see someone's carved something, you go there a week later, there's a bigger carving, there's a new word, there's a new handprint. Um, this idea that someone's trying to communicate, I was here. I think photographs do something similar. And that my photographs are also kind of about that. Um, I was here, I saw these things, I felt these things I'd like to share. You mentioned repeating kind of subjects and themes. Yeah. Is that, um, I'm guessing that's kind of subconsciously happening? Or are you, I, 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 did you get to a point where you're conscious of it and it, started it seeking it out? It definitely started subconsciously. And then um, I started noticing patterns and things like um, messages carved by, sorry, short kind of single words. Um, handprints, glass. One of the things that I really like about glass is that it takes away this idea that a good photograph is high resolution or sharp. When you take a photo of a reflection, the idea that a specific thing has to be sharp suddenly changes because a reflected image will lose clarity right away. And what's behind it and what's in front of it also becomes kind of ambiguous. And so by taking that, it no longer becomes like, what camera did you take this with? Or why is this in focus? You get to make a choice in terms of what's in focus, but it's not so much about whether or not it re captures life realistically. It becomes about this play on, we walk by these things every day and we don't realize that we choose to focus on a plane, right? The, the, the front, the middle, the back. And we, we take a lot of this stuff for granted. And the storytelling kind of you have there's like this storytelling element and you like books yeah oh you brought a book here mm. to read on the, uh, on the train <laughs> I as an option i wasn't sure I, I think it was just um so it's called the city by cp cavafy and it's about um finding out that you can travel well this is my interpretation it doesn't matter how far away you travel from home you can't escape what or who you are and i read it when i first moved abroad and it kind of really set the tone because I think there's this constant struggle. People who, who make art often feel like they either become really intimate with their hometown or they move away. And when you move away, you might, you know, I have to come to this understanding. Am, am I running away from something? Um, do I need to be away from my hometown to take the pictures that I'm taking? What's involved in taking pictures? of a place that you know my, my family hasn't gone to or my relatives haven't gone to. What am I accomplishing by documenting this space instead of where I grew up? And there's a confrontation with that because every time you leave home, you can't be with your family or you're not with your friends that you've known for 20 years. And so that this idea, it's a strange, it's, it seems loaded, but like, what are you, not sacrifice, but what are you giving up to pursue a thing that you love, right? Because your family is important. Where you're from is, is also part of who you are. And when you travel, especially street photographers, like we talked about before, there's this idea that street photographers travel and document the world. And that some of their strength as a photographer is this consistent vision. You see someone's photograph and go, it doesn't matter if that was taken in Poland, in Australia, in Brazil, this is the way this guy takes pictures. And there's something kind of magical about the idea that no matter where he is in the world or where she is, or where they are in the world, they're able to take an image that's instantly recognizable. There's a cost. And you saying you, you, you like think in narratives. <laughs> it seems like that anyway. Yeah, oh, for sure. And so when, you, when you're kind of putting together your photos, when you're putting them together, and even when you're capturing them, are you mm. thinking, or when, you, when you're putting them together, I'm sure you're thinking of a narrative there. Yeah. But when you're taking them, are you thinking of a narrative? How, mm. like, what that narrative is going to be, and the place that that photo will take in that narrative? Um, I think I try to make sense of why certain photos tend to reappear, or why they they like. Um, so it took five weeks for me to get from Sweden to. Australia it took a little while for the visa to get processed and moved away and I was taking all these pictures and I was trying to figure out um, 
what it meant. And then when I got here, I spent a few weeks looking at all of the photos and combining them. And what came out was like I, I'd taken a picture of a bed that was leaning against a wall somewhere. Then I found another picture. I realized two weeks later I'd taken um, the, the base of a bed uh, outside in the middle of nowhere. I'd also taken a picture uh, that got kind of blurred as a longer exposure and it almost looked like flapping paper. And then I started thinking about, okay, so there's this bed, this bed's been taken away, there's this flapping thing, and it kind of gave me permission because I, I saw a sequence of images to think, okay, this was kind of like a dream space, this very kind of unreal space because I could have been abroad waiting to come over for several more weeks. There was no real breakdown on how many weeks I'd be over. And so I was sleeping um, and waking up in different cities every week and photographing things without really having a purpose because I, I, I couldn't spend that much money because I wasn't getting any money in. And I didn't know how long I was going to be abroad for. Um, and so I had to just kind of float. And the images, when I was looking at them, felt like they were expressing that in some way. But having them randomly, if I would have put them um, chronologically, there'd be a lot of, it would seem very random. At least looking at it from my point of view, it seems really random. And so when I look at them and I can kind of sequence them so that there's some sort of sense to them, I think it makes it easier for the viewer to understand kind of interiorly what it felt like to go through that space or have that that kind of big gap. Um, there's a question that I, I kind of ask a lot of photographers. I'd love to, to hear your thought on this too. Um, does the work that we make influence the way we see our memories or do our memories influence the way we work? And so when you take a picture of something and you look back on it, right, you've already passed that moment. And so do you look at that photo and go, oh, I must have felt this way when I took this picture? Or do you now see this picture and go, this is making me feel something in the present and it's kind of altered? I don't think you can, I think it's very difficult to have that photo exist simultaneously in two different ways. I just can't figure out which one influences which. Um, for me, I think it, it depends on um, the, the place I'm in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, when I look at the photo again. So sometimes it'll, it'll take me back mm -hmm. to the moment I, I took the photo like, and how I, I was feeling then. And I have photos that some that I took 10, 15 yeah. years ago that I, I still remember. They, they, they still pop into my head every now and then. Why? And, and sometimes it'll make me feel something. I'll see something new hmm. in it. So I, it can be both. It, it can be, you know, and I'll have a completely different feeling about it. Um, I don't know if this answers your, answers your question. I, but maybe, maybe that is the answer is that there's no fix. Because like that. anyone else looking at, anyone's photo you know you're gonna um you're gonna feel different feelings depending mm. on the state of mind you're in mm. the play and the experiences if you, you've had uh, between mm. taking the photo and the moment you're looking at it so you might take a photo a photo print it right and you look at it then and then a month later a lot's happened in that month so you've changed so you might look at that, that same photo and feel something completely mm. different um and yeah i've never really thought about it but i'm i'm thinking about it now and it's yeah it's it's an, it's an interesting question so, so yeah. much of like i think with with uh these facebook instagram whatever so much of who we are ends up as on the internet and or in terms of images you might look back and you know, from the way it was posted, there's some sort of progression that comes up in your mind. And it's interesting because it's so constant. Do we do we personally read into this and, and form who we are as a result of all of these accumulated images or does it stay separate? And I think, yeah, a lot of the, it's difficult now to take pictures and try to have something to say because so much has been said. And I think a, a lot of people are going back to Sweden, you become kind of introverted and you try to, think about the images as they relate to you. But then if they only relate to you, why should anybody care? <laughs> why should anybody care? And it becomes this trying to figure out a dialogue of, of making art that means something to you, 
but it's also I think a lot of art making is also about communication and, and trying to share it with you know friends family strangers well I think you when you make art you're, you're sharing a part of yourself yeah and uh, and I think that's how it should be approached. I mean, uh, you, you mentioned social media and all, mm. and all that sort of stuff. And there's probably uh, a lot of art out there that's made because it's the current the current thing, right? And yeah. how much... I don't know how much of the artist is in that art. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, and I'm not knocking it. I'm not saying it's bad art or anything like that. But uh, I... I and I could be completely wrong, mm. but I, I do question how or well, how much of this is you, right? Um, and personally, I and I I think if you start thinking about, well, uh, I'm doing this because this is the in thing. Mm. I think you've already done your your, your spirit a bit of a disservice. 100%. But I mean. Yeah. It's, it'll also mean more people will look at it and like it and, and maybe that's what you want um, and there's other people out there who you know they you look at a piece of their work it's all them yeah all right something that's both personal and universal right that's what like the really great artists you know it's this person that's made this thing and it's showing you the way of looking at the world and yet it's also part of part of them yeah. and that kind of answers the question i guess you had of like why are people why are people looking at it right you know it right it because be they want to see mm. uh your the, uh, your particular point which uh, point of view which is unique you know yeah. and and the way one particular person looks at and experiences the world and mm. and the artwork is a manif manifestation mm. of that. Yeah, I don't know if that made any sense whatsoever. <laughs> I, I feel like you're interviewing me. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, see now, 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 now I'm like, uh, where do I go from here? Look, <laughs> I don't know. Is is do you feel your work is do you, do you have you ever looked at your own work and and thought you're you're jumping on a trend? Um, when I started taking pictures, my teachers were big on color photography, very formal, like Joel Sternfeld, Stephen Shore. If you did street photography, like bright colors, low ISO sharp images um, objectively placed and I don't necessarily know if that's still like a thing that's being taught in schools now quite as much because there's so much that's happened in the last 10 years but one of the things that I, I was taking a lot of pictures that way and one of the things that I realized when I moved to Sweden um, almost all the photographers that I looked up to shot in black and white and one of them like William Klein will go from sharp images to blurry images to low ISO to high ISO and he's telling a story or he's capturing a movement and he's capturing a sensation by sequencing these images. And I remember when I first looked at them, I was like, why aren't all of his photos out of focus? Or why aren't all of them sharp? Like, why is he jumping back and forth? And it was that kind of teaching that said it has to be one or the other. And I don't know if I would say I'm influenced by anybody else's stuff at the moment. There, there's work that I go back to and that inspires me I, I really like this uh photographer called john max he's dead now he's canadian he made a book called open passport and i never seen images sequenced that way before towards the end of the book there's a single image that's repeated there's so that'll be the image and then something else and then the image and then something else and then the image and the image that's repeated just gets smaller as it goes through and then there's also a four panel layout on a page where you can't quite tell if the top left image and the bottom right image um, are the same one or a slightly different take because they're printed slightly differently. There's another photographer that I like called Ralph Gibson who did something similar where it's, it seems like it could be the same image uh, one after the other but slightly cropped. And 
I just was really fascinated with this idea of representation. So we have this thing that is the same thing, but not quite the same thing. It's like if you're looking at something and you lean in or lean back, what you're seeing is still a mountain or a friend or food, but it's that subtle change in perspective kind of makes you ask some questions. And so I think that's been the biggest influence on on the shift in the work and trying to make, you know, I, I stick generally for projects stick to black and white because it becomes an abstraction. It's easier to put things together, right? If you have vastly different colors from one image to another, it becomes about the colors. If you have them in black and white and it's one after the other, it really becomes about the subject or the content uh, themselves, the shapes that are being seen. Is, is there a place for color in your in your I, body of work? Um, I, yeah, like uh, the travel photos, if I do a place, I'll, I tend to try to stick to color just as a way to differentiate. Because I think if you go somewhere and you take a picture and you're, you're trying to capture reality, reality's in, in, in color. And so you're kind of showing this thing as it was. When it comes to, at least the way I work, my, my personal projects, um, they're not they're not dreamlike, but they're, it's kind of an acknowledgement that what you're seeing is what it is, but it also isn't. It, it's something that I've experienced or felt. And by putting them into black and white, it becomes, um, at least from the point of view of how we're often taught with, with imagery, something that's happened in the past and something that you're trying to make sense of. Um, Movies often do black and white flashbacks to show you this is at an older place. I'm not hoping that they think it's taken in the 50s or something, but it is a way of acknowledging that this is sequence and this is a story and there is manipulation involved. Even if I'm not Photoshopping things in or out, it's a subtle way for me to say this is the world that I'm feeling or the world that I've seen or the world that I've created and it's separate than the world that I visit. It's an interior space rather than a, an exterior one. I mean, personally, I'm of the opinion that, you know, colour color distracts a little mm. too much. Sometimes. For, for most photos, I think, mm. I think most photos, um, monochrome is mm. the way to go. I think uh, it, it just, I can't even explain it. Like, I shoot mostly black and white. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I maybe shot a handful of rolls of colour yeah. film. In the, in the last couple of years, um, I, don't know, I, fi I find color a little too distracting, mm -hmm. uh, to be honest. It, it just kind of, maybe it's because I look at a lot of black and white photography that right. I look at a color photograph and it kind of hurts my eyes, mm. if that makes any sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was wondering if you might have that same one because you've Co got a lot of black and white. Work. Color correction too, right? Like you, you can really, if it's tinted blue, tinted green, tinted yellow slightly, like all of that makes a huge difference on the, the atmosphere of the image. Whereas in black and white, um, it becomes detail or not detail. It becomes uh, focus points or kind of shaded or mysterious. It, 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 it simplifies, I don't, to me, I think it simplifies the image in a way. That's kind of, like you said, rather than color being a distraction, black and white kind of becomes very much about what's in the frame. You're, you're acknowledging this is not a window into reality. This is kind of a, a work that's been registered or made by a person and they want to show it to you. Because photographs aren't real. Right, exactly. None of them. None yeah. of them are. They're all, they're all edited in some way. Uh, they're edited at the moment you make the capture. There was so. a, um, one of my mentors told me this and it, it shook me and I, I'm happy to share this with you said so one of the really interesting things about um, SLR cameras, single lens reflex cameras, right, um, is that when you take a picture and you're looking through the viewfinder, if you've got your eye closed, when the mirror goes up to allow the image to come through, what you're doing is sacrificing the experience yourself to document what's taking place. And it's changed a little bit with a phone or a digital camera, but this idea is like you've captured something that you haven't actually seen. And then, and then if you want to go really kind of overboard with some of this stuff that's really interesting, I think most photographers would be very happy and very proud if they had like 70 good photos. We could even say 60 good photos. Their whole career, they have 60 amazing pictures. You'd be like, this is a life well lived as an artist, as a photographer. Um, but if you think about the average shutter speed and you think about most people will say, you know, the lowest you want to shoot is 125, 60th of a second to, to remain some sort of clarity, some sharpness. 
those entire 60 seconds, if they were shot at 1 60th of a second, your entire life's work was one second of your life combined together, which is kind of nothing else amounts to that in, in sculpting and painting, this instantaneousness that photography has. And it's a very different art form. Justin, I think that's a perfect place <laughs> to to end the podcast. Cool. Thank you for coming along and um, Thank you. sharing your story and your, your knowledge. And uh, who knows, maybe uh, we'll, we'll have you on again <laughs> if people want. It's up to the people. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks, sir.